read the whole passage, verse 13 to verse 20. Follow with me in your Bible. Paul says, For this cause, verse 13, also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, you re, you, as you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh in you also that believe. For ye were brethren become, for you brethren became followers of the churches of God, which were in Judea and of, of, in Christ Jesus. For ye have also suffered like things of your own countrymen, as they also have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus, they killed their own prophets, they persecute us, they please not God, and they are contrary to all men. They forbid us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fulfill their sins alway, for the wrath of God has come upon them to the uttermost. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time, in presence but not in heart, we endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come to you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Notice that. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Are not even you in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and our joy. The great A.W. Tozer once said, and I quote, the Christian life is not a playground, it is a what? Battleground. You know the quote. And if you've been a Christian for very long, you know that the Christian life is not easy. It's not a bed of roses. There's thorns along the way. Jesus said, behold, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So we are redeemed. We're blessed. The Lord is with us. He will not leave us or forsake us. But it doesn't mean that we're immune from the storms of life. It doesn't mean the immunity from the trials of life or being afflicted or persecuted for our faith in Jesus Christ. In a world of hostility, the church in Thessalonica was born. It was born through the ministry of Paul the Apostle on the second missionary journey recorded in the book of Acts chapter 17. You can read about it if you want to make a note and go there this afternoon and read about the beginning of the church in Thessalonica, Acts chapter 17. But in the first chapter of the book of 1 Thessalonians, Paul says in verse 7 that they were an example to all the believers that were in Macedonia, which is northern Greece, and the Kai, which is southern Greece. So this church is called a model church. Now he broke it down. He said that you were an elect church, chapter 1, verse 4, knowing, brother and beloved, your election of God. Secondly, they were an evangelistic church, chapter 1, verse 8. He says, from you sounded out the word of God. And then they were, an ex they were an expectant church, chapter 1 and verse 10. They were waiting for the Lord to come from heaven. So I like this letter to the Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Thess, because it's written to a model church, and there's a lot of pictures for the church. But it was not only a model church, they had a model minister or pastor. His name was Paul the Apostle. And Paul the Apostle was like a father who faithfully preached to them God's word. Look at chapter 2 and verse 11 and 12 quickly with me. He says, as you know how we exhorted and we comforted and we encouraged every one of you as a father does his children. And that you would walk worthy, verse 12, of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and his glory. So here we have a model church and a model minister or pastor, Paul. And Paul was like a loving father who exhorted them and comforted them and encouraged them that they, chapter 2, verse 12, would walk worthy of the glory and the kingdom that God had called them to. So they were a model church with a model pastor or minister, but that didn't mean that life was easy for the believers in Thessalonica. I want to point something else out before we unpack our text. Look at chapter 1 and verse 6. He mentions the phrase, much affliction. That's what they were going through, chapter 1, verse 6. And then in chapter 2, verse 14, our text, go back there, they were suffering like things of their own countrymen. Then in chapter 2, verse 15, they were persecuted. Paul says they persecuted us. And then in chapter 2, verse 18, 
he uses the expression we'll come to, Satan hindered us. And then jump forward to chapter 3 and verse 3, where it says that no man should be moved by these afflictions. Notice that. For yourselves know that we were appointed there unto. Now the list could go on and on and on. Needless to say, this is a sampling of the fact that they were persecuted, they were afflicted, they were suffering, they were going through hard times. And Paul says, we want you to know that you were appointed thereunto. What a word of encouragement. You were appointed by God to go through hardships. And he said, I thought you were telling us how we can have strength for the battle. I am. But there is battles in life, amen? And you can't avoid them. There's no Christian fallout shelters. God doesn't put you in a Holy Ghost bubble and protect you from the things of this world. But he's promised to give you his divine resources to strengthen you for the battle. Write down 2 Timothy 3.12, where Paul says, yes, all that will live godly, and in the Greek it's actually desire to live godly, in Christ Jesus shall suffer what? Persecution. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But God provides divine resources to give us strength for the battle. So what I want to do in this text, I want to give you three of the divine resources that we have to give us strength to be able to face the battles of life. If you're taking notes, you can write them down. Number one, God has given us his word within us. So we have the word of God within us, verse 13. I want you to go back there and look at it with me. Paul says, for this cause. Now, what is he speaking about? He's speaking about in chapter 1 to chapter 2, 12, he's talking about how he preached and delivered the gospel to them. In light of the fact that he was preaching the gospel without compromise to them, and now he begins in verse 13 of chapter 2 to speak about how they received the word. You know, there's two parts to the word of God. There's the hearing the word, there's the receiving the word. There's the preaching of the word, which the pastor does in the congregation, and then the receiving of the word, and the word working mightily in the hearts of God's people. Every church should be a Bible church. Amen. The Bible is the center of the Christian life. We learn about Christ, we grow to love Christ, know Him and serve Him. As the Spirit of God, we're going to see in verse 13, uses the Word of God to transform the child of God into the image of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so the focus in Paul's ministry in Thessalonica was on the Word of God. So the church in Thessalonica was born, founded, and the believers' lives were transformed by the Spirit of God through the preaching of the Word of God. So he says that you received, verse 13, the Word of God which you heard of us, received it not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth, the Word of God. So twice he uses that term, the Word of God, which effectually or effectively worketh also in you that what? Believe. So this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I don't know if you believe me when I say that because I say that about a lot of verses. Whatever verse I'm preaching is my favorite verse. <laughs> but I love this verse because it talks about the effect of God's Word in the life of God's people to transform their lives. And I'm all about that. So Paul was thankful to God that they were receptive to God's word. The best way to find strength in life's battles is to hide God's word in your heart. Amen. David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not, what? Sin against you. So as we hide God's word in our hearts, and we receive God's word, we're transformed from God's word, he gives us strength for the battle. But I really, really think it's important to note in verse 13 that it works effectually. It works effectually. That word effectual means that it performs its desired purpose. God's word will not come back void. It will accomplish the purposes that God sent it to accomplish. 
So my question is, is God's word working effectually in your life? Are you bored with the book? Are you bored with the word of God? When you read the scriptures, do you just go, oh, this is too boring. Let's watch TV or a movie. Let's go do something else. Or do you have an appreciation for God's word? Do you value God's word? Do you hunger for God's word? The thing that's going to give you strength, and this is simple but not simplistic, in the battles of life is building your life on the word of God. Amen? Building your life, building your marriage, building your family, building your career, your job, your calling, your occupation. You build everything on the foundation of God's word, and then and only then you'll be able to stand against the storms that come in life. Now, I want to ask three questions, if you're taking notes, about your relationship to the Word of God. Number one, do you appreciate God's Word? Do you appreciate God's Word? Look at verse 13. He says, you receive the Word not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth, the Word of God. Do you have that same outlook? This isn't man's opinion. These are not man's views. This is not just the word of men. It is actually God's holy word. The Bible is the word of God. And I wanted to to note, I already mentioned it, but point out in verse 13 that twice he uses the expression, the word of God. He mentions that twice. The Bible is the what? Word of God. God, living, powerful, active word of God. Not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. Write down 2 Timothy 3, 16. I give it to you often, and I'm going to keep giving it to you until the Lord takes me home. All scripture is given by what? Inspiration of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16. We know John 3, 16. Memorize, memorize 2 Timothy 3. 316. All scriptures given by inspiration of God and is what? Profitable for what is right, what is wrong, how to get right, and how to stay right. Doctrine, reproof, instruction, and righteousness. That the man or woman of God, 2 Timothy 3:17, may be perfect or mature, equipped for all good works and acts of service. So you want to be mature and strong. And you need the Word of God hidden in your heart. But you need to value it and appreciate it as God's Word. It's Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, where the writer of Hebrews said, the Word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword, and it pierces the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, the joint and marrow, becomes the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So God's Word has power. Write down Psalm 19, verse 7 to 10, and I'm going to give you seven things that we need to view about the Word of God, seven qualities of the Scriptures. It's perfect, number one. The word means there in Psalm 19, comprehensive. And then the psalmist says it converts the soul. Secondly, it is sure, again, Psalm 19, or true, making wise the simple, that is the morally simple, that don't know right from wrong. They can see clearly. And then thirdly, the word of God is right. What it does is rejoice the heart, brings joy to our hearts. And then fourthly, the word of God is pure. Psalmist says it enlightens your eyes. It helps you to see life clearly. I believe every Christian should have a biblical worldview. Everything we view in life should be viewed through the lens of Scripture. And then it is clean. The Bible says enduring forever means it's relevant to all generations. Sometimes people think the Bible is irrelevant. Nothing could be more relevant than God's living, powerful word. And you know that God continues to speak through what he's spoken. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It means it's God breathed. That God superintended the human authors. The very words they wrote were the words of God. I believe it's inspired by God. I believe it's inerrant. I believe it's infallible. I believe it's clear. I believe it's sufficient. It's all that we need for life and godliness. And then the psalmist says, Psalm 19, that it's true, a righteous altogether. It makes you live a righteous life. 
And then verse 10 of Psalm 19, the seventh mark. It's more to be desired than gold, yea, than much fine gold. I would rather have God's word than the, than the win the million dollar lottery. You go, but then I could buy a, lunch, a bunch of Bibles. You don't need a bunch of Bibles, you only need one Bible. Some of us have 10 Bibles, but we don't read any of them. Look at my Bible collection. I don't read them, but aren't they wonderful? God's word is more to be desired than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey from the honeycomb. So here's my question. Do you appreciate God's word? Do you understand this book is not just the word of men, but it is indeed the very word of God? Then second question on verse 13 I want to ask is, do you absorb God's word? Do you absorb God's word? Notice verse 13 You received the word of God, then also again, you received it not as the word of men. He uses the word received twice. And the first time he uses the word received, it means to accept a gift from another. The second word received it, not as the word of men, but as received it as the word of God, means to welcome it gladly or welcome it joyfully. So not only did they accept God's word, but they gladly welcomed it into their heart and life. So there's the preaching of the word, but there's the hearing of the word. You know, from the pew's perspective, you're always focusing on the pulpit. But from the pulpit perspective, the focus is the pew. So there's both the preaching of the word and the hearing of the word. So we need to be biblical listeners. We need biblical preachers, but we need biblical listeners. People that say, this is the word of the Lord, and I want to welcome it gladly into my heart. Not analyzing the preacher's vocabulary or the points of his sermon or how eloquent he is or funny he is, but saying, what is God saying to me today? And Paul was thankful for them that they received God's word. I'm thankful that you, as a congregation, come with Bibles in hand, and you open the scriptures, you hear the Bible, and you receive it not as men's word, but God's word because it does work effectually in us. So my second question is, do you absorb it? Notice verse 13, you received it as not man's word, but God's word. Do you let God's word sink into your heart, not just your head? And then third question is, do you apply God's word into your life? So do you appreciate God's word? Do you absorb God's word? And then thirdly, do you apply it? Notice verse 13, It says, the word of God which effectually works in you that what? Believe. You know, it's not just the hearing of the Bible. It's the believing of the Bible, faith. And it it actually implies obedience. So you hear, you receive, and then you obey God's word. You must believe and obey God's word. James chapter 1, verse 22 James says, be what? Doers of the word, not hearers only. Because if you just hear the word of God and you don't do the word of God, then you're deceiving your own self. It's like looking in a mirror, seeing that you need help, but forgetting what you've seen and going your way. You ever seen somebody show up for work in the morning and you think, do you own a mirror? (laughs) I don't usually say that, I just think that, forgive me. Have you looked in the mirror lately? You need help. Or looking in the mirror, when I get up in the morning, all my hair faces one direction. It all, goes, it all goes south, you know. It's like bed head to the max. And I don't go out and face the day like that. I remember I need help, and I apply a little water and some combs and put some gel in there and comb my hair and everything. So, you know, when I look into God's Word, I, I need help. And so I spend time praying and meditating in the Spirit of God, transforming and then working effectually in us that put it into practice and belief. So we are fit for the storms of life by the Word of God within us. And that's something God has provided for everyone. And this is absolutely foundational. I can 100% guarantee you strength for the storms of life if you build your life on God's Word. Amen? Amen. 
God's word will strengthen you. Here's the second divine resource. Write it down in verse 14 to 16. Not only has God given his word within us, but secondly, we have God's people around us. God's people around us, or the people of God around us. Look at verse 14 again with me. Paul says, for ye brethren, one of his favorite titles for believers, he used it again in verse 17. He says, you became followers or imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea. Now, these are the churches that were in Jerusalem. The believers there were primarily Jews, which were in Christ Jesus. For you also have suffered, there it is, like things of your own countrymen. That would be the Gentiles persecuting the believers there in Thessalonica, which was a Greek city. So he says, you suffered there in Thessalonica by your Gentile brethren or people, your countrymen, excuse me, just as we suffered by the Jews in Judea, even as they have the Jews. Notice verse 15, who both killed the Lord Jesus. Now, this is one of the most stern indictments Paul ever brought against the Jewish people. He wasn't anti-Semitic by any means. His heart's desire in Israel was that they be saved. But as a fact of history, not only did the Romans kill Jesus, not only did the Jews kill Jesus, but we killed him with our sins on the cross. So, but he says the Jews both killed the Lord Jesus, their own prophets, they have persecuted us, they please not God, verse 15, and they are contrary to all men. They're persecuting the believers. They forbid us, verse 16, to speak to the Gentiles, they might be saved, to fill up their sins all way, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. So God uses the persecution of unbelievers to justify his judgment upon them when his wrath is poured out. But the point I want to make there in verse 14 is that they have suffered like things from their own countrymen, even as they have the Jews. In other words, you are not alone. Paul is writing to them and telling to encourage them that these saints in Thessalonica were suffering just like the saints were suffering in Judea. So we're part of one fellowship, one family, one body, just as they suffer there or as the believers suffer in Haiti or in other parts of the world. So we are part of one family. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ. But the, th the point is that we're not alone. God's given us his church. So Paul actually means to encourage them by telling them, look, you're not alone. We suffered in Jerusalem, the Judean church, and you suffered there in Thessalonica, the Gentile church from your countrymen. But we're part of one fellowship, one family, and one body. Now, if you take a stand, verse 13, on God's word, you will suffer for your stand, verse 14. Verse 14 naturally follows verse 13 thematically, and that if you take a stand on God's word, that you will be persecuted and suffer in the world. But we are not alone. We're part of a family of God, the church, the body of Christ. You know, one of the sad tragedies of these past several months or year that we have experienced this pandemic around the world called COVID-19 that the church has had such division and strife in it. People arguing over vaccinations and masks and all the things that are going on in the world and the crazy chaotic world that we live in. And I believe that the church is essential for the Christian life. We are not alone. We can't do it without one another. There's no substitute for coming to church and being to church and praying and worshiping together and singing and hearing God's word and encouraging one another. So the point I want to make is as you face these battles in our world, we need one another. We need the church. We need the fellowship of the body of Christ. I want you to write these down. The Bible is full of one another's in the body of Christ. Write down John 13, 34, love one another. Write down John 13, verse 14, wash one another's feet. Write down 1 Thessalonians 5.11, edify one another. 
Write down Galatians 6 and verse 2. Bear one another's burdens. How do you do that if you're alone? And then write down Ephesians 4, verse 32. Forgive one another. And then write down 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 9. I love it where it says, show hospitality to one another. Not only should we be reaching out to one another, we should be inviting one another into our homes. I really urge you and encourage you, you need the local church. You need the local fellowship. You need to be knit together with other believers. Be a part of a dinner fellowship. Be a part of a life group. Be a part of a small group. Come to women's Bible study, men's Bible study. Come on Wednesday nights. Get involved in ministry. Be connected. Because when you are facing opposition and persecution and Satan tries to hinder you and you're going through a battle in life, you not only need the Word of God within you, you need the people of God around you praying for you, loving you, encouraging you, bearing one another's burdens. Amen? There's a third divine resource. It's in verse 17 to 20, especially the key verse, verse 19, and that is the glory of God before us. So we have the Word of God within us. We have the people of God around us when we suffer. And then we have the glory of God before us. Look at verse 17. He says, But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, but not in heart, we endeavor the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Let me explain what Paul is saying here. Paul, when he went to Thessalonica in Acts 17, was only there for three short weeks, and the church was born. Model church in three weeks. And then the persecution came from the Jews, and he had to be driven out from there. That's when he went to Berea, and he went to other places. Then he ended up in Acts chapter 18 in Athens. And then he sent Timothy back to check on them. But he'd only been there for three weeks. So what happened was, this is how Satan tries to hinder us, is Satan sent Jews into the church saying, Paul doesn't really love you. Paul's not really a true minister of God. He departed from you. He left you. He bailed on you. He forsook you. So Paul is writing to them to affirm his love. I was taken from you, verse 17. That word taken from you, that phrase, literally means I was orphaned. Now earlier he had spoken about him as a pastor being like a loving mother and a supportive father. And then he says, when I was driven away from you, I, I, I was orphaned. I think about the 10 weeks when our church was shut down with covid and I literally preached to an empty sanctuary for 10 weeks. I was orphaned. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done. <laughs> to preach to an empty sanctuary for 10 weeks, my wife can bear witness of how agonizing that was for me, to just preach into a camera and not to see your lovely faces. Thank God we're gathering and we're worshiping together as the body of Christ. We need each other. And the world needs the church. If there's anything the world needs right now is the church, amen? amen? To be a light to the world, to take the word of God and to be a model. But I think of Paul when he said to them, I was orphaned, verse 17. I was taken in presence, but not in heart. My heart was truly there. He was being attacked by his critics. And I endeavored more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Paul's great love. Wherefore, we would have come to you, even I, Paul, once and again. But here it is, verse 18. But Satan hindered us. Now, I can preach a whole sermon on that statement. Satan hindered us. There really is a devil. If you're taking notes right now, there really is a devil. Watch out. Be sober. Be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may what? Devour. But God will use even the devil for our good and for his glory. God will serve, use Satan to serve his own purposes. So there really is a devil. In Paul's case, he sent Jewish opposition and persecution. He put Paul 
in prison. And then he also allowed Satan to afflict Paul's body. It's called a thorn in his flesh. 2 Corinthians 12, a messenger of Satan to what? Buffet him. If you want to find out whether there's a real devil or not, begin to read the Bible. Begin to obey the Bible, and you'll meet the devil. You go, that's supposed to be an encouragement to read the Bible? <laughs> but don't let it scare you, because God still sits on the throne, amen? That's right, amen? God is in control. Greater is he that's in you than is he that is in the world. And that's what Satan wants us, to be afraid. He wants us to cower in fear. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. He's given us power and love and what a sound mind speaks of our emotions. He's given us a sound mind. So we're to stand on God's word. We're to be supported by God's people. And we're to realize that Satan will oppose us trying to thwart the purposes of God. But God's grace is sufficient for us. His strength is made perfect in our what? Weakness. Now I want you to notice the key text of verse 19. For what is our hope? What is our joy? What is our crown? Of rejoicing. This is a rhetorical question, and Paul answers it. Are not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his what? Coming, the Greek word parousa, his appearing. At the end of each chapter in 1 Thessalonians, you have a reference to the coming again of Jesus Christ. So Paul starts with the word of God within us, the people of God around us, and the coming of Christ before us. And that's our strength to keep our focus on Jesus Christ who's coming again, who will bring with him our rewards, amen? Must never, ever forget, when the outlook is bad, try the uplook. Look to the hope of heaven. Jesus Christ is coming again. I love what Paul says in verse 19. He says, our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing is you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. So Paul knew that Jesus would come again that the believers in Thessalonica would be in his presence, that he would see them and know them in heaven, and that they would be his joy and his crown at his coming. Notice verse 20, for you are our glory and our joy. Now when Jesus comes, will you rejoice in his presence because of the people that have, you have influenced for Christ? I think about this. All the years of serving the Lord will all be worth it all when we see Jesus. All the suffering, all the denial, all the hardships, all the difficulties, it'll all be worth it when we see Jesus. And when we hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of the Lord, amen. Only when life will soon be passed and only what's done for Christ will what? Last. My encouragement for you is get grounded in God's word, get surrounded by God's people, and set your eyes on our future hope of heaven. Amen? Let's pray.